from the book of Esther. If you would please take your scriptures, I'd like to hear rustling of the pages, turn your Bible to Esther chapter 5 this evening. We're going to try to get through two chapters. I'll be away next week, and so Brother Cooper is going to be covering for me, so thank you, Brother Cooper, for doing that. And he's going to continue with our studies so we can keep the continuity of, uh, of the lessons. So tonight's lesson, I guess it's, it says lesson six here, uh, is the demise of Haman and the rise of Mordecai. Wow, that sounds good, doesn't it? Because we know who Haman was. Aren't we glad that Haman's, his, his day is coming here? Last week we saw, if you see there in your notes, that Esther um, was making the biggest decision of her life, wasn't she? I mean, it was massive to seek the favor of the king in person without having have been summoned by him to plead for the lives of her people and so for herself as well. And so she is putting her life on the line in, in reaching out there and, and wanting to um, resign herself to do what she had to do no matter what. Most of us probably have not been there for our faith, have we? Where we're putting our faith on the line and our confidence on the line in Christ to be able to, to, to protect us even in the midst of losing our very life. But here was Esther who could have been snuffed out in a moment if the king was not favorable to her. And so she stated boldly there, as you see in 416, if I perish, what? I perish. She was resigned to give herself up in order to protect her people. And so we need to recognize that wonderful thing about about. Um, Esther. And so here we are. The big day has now come. They've been praying about it. Esther had the challenge of entering the presence of the king uninvited. That was a no-no. And it was really sort of against the law. And so she was sort of violating that, but she had a, a cause. And all the Jews were dependent upon her for their lives, and they didn't know it. She is going to do this thing, and not everyone really knew just exactly how dangerous it was going to be for her. So she had been queen for five years at this point already. Five years. And did she have enough clout to be accepted by the king? So as you know, we talked about last week, she had spiritually prepared herself by way of review for three days of fasting, and she had asked all of her people, the other fellow Jews, not just her maidens who took care of her in her, in her sort of uh, cabinet there, her entourage, but also all the Jews around the land. The word got out, pray and fast for Esther. And so uh, prayers went up on her behalf. And so she put on her royal, royal apparel. She's going to present herself to the king with official business, not a sensual pass, to give the king favor that way. She's wanting favor from the king for herself and for her people. And so, again, her life could be taken in an instant because of her forwardness coming in uh, unannounced and uncalled, unsummoned, so to speak. And so she's placed herself at great risk for the hope of saving her people. So what would be the outcome? Well, in your notes, before we even... Um, we look at, we read the scripture. I want to I wanna show you Esther's risk. Then we'll read the scriptures here. But look at, at what Esther, Esther was risking here, there in your notes. First of all, it was the risk of rejection. The risk of rejection. Not knowing if you'll be accepted or rejected by someone who holds power over you is a very powerful force. We might think of it like in, in business or at your work that the boss could fire you if they don't like what you've done or how you're performing. And you could be out of a job very quickly. Or someone in the family could turn on you and just sort of dismiss you quickly. And so everyone wants to be like folks, don't, folks, don't we? We all want to be like. We want to be accepted. And why shouldn't Esther feel the king should accept her? After all, she is her husband, and she did find favor with him five years ago above all the other women, the beautiful women of the nation. But at the same time, the king hadn't seen or summoned her in the last 30 days. And so that's what it says in 4.11. That's what's adding to her consternation. You see there, it says um, at the end of verse 11, almost the very end, but I have not been called to come in unto the king these 30 days. That would only add to her angst and her concern. Why hasn't he called me? Why hasn't he, he, he uh, wanted to... Find out about what's going on with me. What's, what did I do wrong? And so 
Did he lose interest in her? Had she offended him in some way that she just didn't know about? She's thinking all this in her mind. And so ultimate power, ultimate power like the king had here can corrupt the heart so the king can use his power to intimidate, to belittle, and to besmirch people uh, just by his very presence and even his own wife. And so she could have caught him on a bad day he got bad news from somewhere else, and so she's risking herself going in, putting herself out there for sure. If you add to that, remember that he banished Vashti, didn't he? Yeah, he didn't think much of her. He said, you're going you're gonna to disrespect me? I'm putting you out of the kingdom. And so he could have had a bad taste in his mouth and seeing the queen in his court without permission because he could reflect back on what Vashti's insubordination did and how it humiliated him. And now here comes his next queen coming in unannounced. What does she want? She knows she's not supposed to be doing that. And maybe he was going to be upset because she was not summoned and now she's being insubordinate. And so that's probably running through her mind as well. And so Esther must have known this and feared this pain of his rejection. Second there in your notes, it was the risk of demotion, the risk of demotion. Esther would have also known what happened to Vashti again, so she's demoted from her regal position. Esther, in a moment, could have been banished right away. Take off your royal robes. Get out of here. Vacate your spot. You're out. The king could do that again in an instant, but it would be worse with Esther because she has great stakes riding on her success. It's the lives of all of her people, the Jews. They're riding on her success here. And so she's fearing this demotion that would keep her from being able to overturn the law that was written against the Jews. Let her see. There's the risk of defamation. The risk of defamation. And that would be, just imagine the embarrassment that she could endure knowing that she was his selection for queen, but she couldn't even get an ear with the king. I'm supposed to be his wife. I'm supposed to be the queen. I don't know that I've done anything wrong. He's found favor with me before, but now for some reason he's not, he's not even summoning me, and I have no way of knowing if he's upset with me or not, and so I can't even seem to get an ear with him. That's defamation. She's thinking, I'm just a nobody if he won't hear me. And so what talk would there be about their relationship? Why is she here? Is there a problem in their relationship? She's come without, without getting approved. And why would the king say no to her? All this stuff was going on. Would she be humiliated? So the risk of defamation, the letter D would be the risk of punishment, just flat out punishment. If you imagine all the king's royal subjects in his throne room, they all knew the rules. They knew how things operated. Esther, again, had appeared unannounced. So you could hear the whisperers, why is she here? Why has she come? Boy, this better be a good excuse because she is violating Persian law. And the king might not be too happy with that, and so on. What would the king do? It's unprecedented. And so Esther is either very brave <laughs> or very foolish to some. And so the risk of punishment. Letter E would be the risk of banishment, as I sort of mentioned. Demotion, now banishment. Like Fasti, she's banished to be a nobody and left alone. So would Vash, after Vashti, would Esther be next? And then let her out there, you see the next one, the risk of even death. Can you picture, can you picture a guard near the king's throne with a huge sword ready to dispatch anyone who would come too close to the king unannounced, who was a potential threat to the king? You wouldn't think beautiful Esther would be that, but they might not take chances. And they could operate just, uh, you know, not just, just uh, flagrantly. And so Esther could have very easily been on that list. Now, those are the risks that she was facing. Those are some things to think about. Uh, there's one more in letter G. But let's now read Esther chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Now, it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house, and the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house. Boy, lots of royalty going on there, right? Lots of royalty over against the gate of the house. And it was so. When the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court, that she obtained favor. Whew. 
right? She obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the the scepter, almost like saying, I acknowledge your greatness, your majesty. I'm touching this scepter, and I'm saying, thank you for giving me voice. Thank you for acknowledging my person. Thank you that I can come in and have this discourse with you and tell you what's going on in my heart. And so letter G then, in your notes, back to that, the risk was averted. The king accepted her appearance before him. And there she is, you see in the picture, just an artist's rendition of Esther coming up to the queen. Can you picture it like that? That, that was just something I, I saw and thought, you know, maybe it was that royal and that grand and that uh, magnificent. And here comes Esther up to see the king with all of his subjects around him and, and she's found favor in the king's sight. And so she put on her royal apparel to show reverence for the king. She was not going to come in underdressed. She was probably in purple and gold and maybe white that showcased her royalty, her, 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 her purity and, and loyalty to her, her king. Uh, she might have been in purple and gold that showcased her regality and she stood in the court to make sure that the king would see her while seated on his royal throne she came in and around the around the corner back at the gate where he was and as soon as he saw her he could have eliminated her right then but he didn't she caught the king's eye as verse 2 says she obtained favor she was granted approval to approach the king death was averted and you know she's probably not thinking just my death was averted that's a good first step the next thing I've got to do is I've got to make a plea to the king for all of my people and my uncle or my cousin Mordecai and to let him know that this is a life or death dire situation. Now she's got to get the, the, uh, the courage up to be able to, to say that. She's gotten through the first hurdle. At least she was accepted. And folks, doesn't the Bible say the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord? So God's behind the scene. Remember, our whole, se- our whole theme is God's got this. God's got this. So God's got Esther. And so while Esther might have had some nervousness, she had to remember that all her people were praying for her. They'd been fasting. And so God clearly was giving her divine favor. I'm sure that went through her mind as well. I'm not up here alone. I have the power of God Almighty, Jehovah, and representing his people and I'm coming with his power and might representing him and so I'm not surprised that the king gave me ear because we've been praying and fasting and God is on our side and so folks don't you love that uh, that verse there in Romans chapter 8 if God be for us what isn't that wonderful we just we just spoke on that in ABF last quarter if God be for us who can be against us we have no bigger enemy than God. God's, our, God's our, our God, so there's no enemy bigger than God in our life to help and protect and provide and, and meet our need and give us strength and confidence in this life. And so if you're facing something right now where you think, Lord, this is too big for me, it's not too big for God, amen? It is not too big for God. Whatever it is, if it's meeting deadlines, if it's meeting a budget, if it's talking with someone that doesn't have a great relationship with you, if it's having to do a new project at work, if it's having to, you know, just uh, sort of be a witness to lost family members or trying to smooth it over with a, with, a, with a neighbor that's not really, you know, pro-Christian and you're trying to witness to them, there's nothing bigger than God. And that's part of this whole thing that, once again, God has got this. God is bigger than anything that we could face. And this was a big one for Esther, no doubt about that, but she found favor because God allowed it. You know, think about this. I believe because Esther was praying and fasting and was turning this over to God, she just wasn't going in in her own beauty and her own allurement that the king might find favor. Because God was involved, I believe, and because of her right spirit, um, he moved upon the 
the, the king to have favor. I, have, I wrote down there in your notes there, look at uh, Isaiah 30, 15, especially the last part, but here's what it says. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall you be saved. Notice, in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. Folks, when this world is reeling, when it seems like everyone is against one another, and it seems like sometimes we as Christians are out there on an island ourselves, God says, look, it's at times like these, I especially want you to know that you're not alone, that I am there for you. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He's a very present help in what? Psalm 46, 1 in time of trouble a very present help in time of trouble and that's what Paul said let your moderation be known unto all in uh, in Philippians chapter 4 verse 5 the Lord is at hand he's right here and sometimes in all the confusion and in all the political unrest and in all the nasty stuff that is going on politically and all the wars and 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 the bridge falling down and the earthquakes that are happening how about an earthquake even around here how about that right you know all sorts of things going on it would be easy for us to become rattled or just you know losing heart a bit but but god says here hey i've got this esther in your quiet confidence that is your strength. That shall be your strength. And folks, it's not about us being powerful in ourself. It's allowing the Lord to be powerful in us and through us. Whether it's a ministry here at church or whether it's at your place of employment or whether it's with your family, extended family, let God be great and almighty in your life. Esther was striving to do that. She had this quiet confidence because God's people were praying and fasting for her. She knew God had covenanted with Abraham to make him a great people. Esther also knew there was already a remnant of the Jews that had the Jews had been allowed to return already to the land, and so they're back in Israel. God was fulfilling his promises to Abraham. Are they all of a sudden now going to be wiped out and all the Jews are going to be destroyed in the whole kingdom? Well, Esther might have known that you know, God will keep his promises to our forefather Abraham. But the king must have also seen maybe some look of trouble in her face because the Hebrew translation, for what wilt thou, verse 3, read it again, then said the king unto her, what wilt thou, Queen Esther? The Hebrew translation for what wilt thou in verse 3 means, in other words, what's troubling you, Esther? I see that you're concerned about something, and naturally she would be. She's concerned. She's bringing a request and she's coming confidently, but there is obviously concern in her heart. And that, so as a result of seeing her distress to some degree, the king makes an unbelievable offer. Not only does he say, Queen, I accept you, what else does he do? Verse 3, Then said the king unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be given thee to half of the kingdom. Well, that's not just a little, a little uh, blessing here. It's like saying, Queen, the kingdom is open to you. What do you need? In essence, I want to satisfy you. I want to make you happy. You seem a little concerned today. I know it's been 30 days. What's going on? God was blessing Esther and his people through this ungodly king. And so that's, that's what's happening. And so Esther would be granted whatever she wanted. So we see that first. Second, in your notes there, you see Esther's request now. She's going to make this request in verse 4. And Esther answered, If it seem good unto the king, let the king of Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. She's now invoking the name Haman. Well, you know, we just learned last week that uh, Haman's being promoted to basically second in charge above all the other cabinet members. And so Esther is recognizing Haman, and Haman was probably there in earshot or whatever, and realizes, wow, this, uh, this, this request that the queen is making is, is for my benefit. This is great. Cause Haman, verse 5, to make haste that he may do as Esther hath said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had prepared. That's the same day. So if she comes in in the morning, it's going to be in the evening. They're having this banquet. And uh, hey, make sure you're there, Haman. 
the king said. And so she makes this request. A, she requested a special banquet with the king and with Haman. And so upon receiving the king's favor, he also granted her this great request. And so, um, you know, she could have had anything she wanted. Do you think Esther would become selfish? Would, would we? And think, well, anything I want, I have the king. Wait a minute. I'm not too concerned about these Jewish people. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask for a bigger castle. I'm going to ask for a new nail salon. I want something great. I want something big. I want a Mediterranean, you know, uh, summer house. King, would you give me one of those? I want more servants. Half the kingdom or anything else. But instead, Esther maintains true to her word and what people were praying about. She's asking for protection upon the plight of her people. That's what she had in mind. And she was doing God's work at that very moment. So she called for a banquet with every intention of exposing evil, the evil intent of Haman himself against her people. But it seems like something happened. It's, it seems like, like something happened. What, what would it be, or what could it be? And because he says in verse 5 there that uh, the king caused Haman to make haste. Hey, king, or king to the, Haman, Haman, hurry up. Esther wants to meet with us. She, she got a banquet prepared. Whatever you have to do, cancel everything. We're meeting with uh, Esther tonight. And so the king said unto Esther at the banquet of wine, what is thy petition? Verse 6, and it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? Again, he says, even to half of the kingdom, it shall be performed. So she's getting ready to make this request. They're at the banquet. But folks, she either lost her courage or she was testing the waters to determine how the king perceived her versus Haman. After all, this is his now first in command, and she's the queen. This is a, a, ba a battle of the titans, so to speak, in the Persian kingdom. Who would have more clout with the king? Would it be her or would it be Haman? And so inviting Haman to a banquet, think about it, would boost Haman's pride and lessen his suspicion about Esther's real intention. I'm invited to a, a banquet, and now she wants to invite me to a second banquet? I must be important. I am, I am getting all this acknowledgement and all this praise. This is great. This is great. Or, on the other hand, perhaps she didn't want to push the king too much in one day since he had already granted her entrance unannounced and that was enough for one day king I, I'm not prepared to, to, to reveal exactly what the banquet's for tonight I've already extended you've, uh, you know, my, uh, my limits with you and you've already given me mercy so I'd like to call another banquet in either, in either case once again God was providentially working behind the scenes because think about it folks the first banquet was not the right timing to present her, present her concern to the king. Haman and Mordecai haven't had this negative interchange, and Haman hadn't gone out yet and built the gallows. And so God had to intervene behind the scenes first to set the scene for the demise of Haman to take place. That had not yet happened. Haman's still basically walking on water with the king and everybody else. So God had to detain or delay the uh, Esther exposing him for who he was until another day. God is working the exact timing out of all this detail. And so you see there in your notes, letter B, she requested a second banquet to expose Haman. We're in verse 7 now of chapter 5. Then answered Esther and said, My petition and my request is this. Repeat, if I have found favor in the sight of the king and if it ple pleased the king to grant my petition and to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I have prepared for them and I will do tomorrow as the king hath said. She had to delay by divine appointment. God was working all this out. Maybe the Spirit of God worked in her mind to say, hey, look, tonight's not the night. You've already gotten approval to speak with the king. You've got ear with him. Ask for another banquet. And because I'm going to be working behind, behind the scenes tonight in Haman's life and in the king's life, and it's going to be perfect timing for tomorrow to have this banquet. God 
is in charge. He's got this. The sovereignty of God is seen in every chapter here throughout the book of Esther. And so she, she, uh, she requests a second banquet. Now, this is going to be more of a private banquet. It's basically, I believe, just going to be the three of them. So it's going to be eliminating the embarrassment of having many people around when she broke the news about Haman's treachery and who he really is and what he really thinks about her and her people, the Jews. And this is going to build a drama to new height. And she had to make sure that she had the, the situation underhand and plan properly yes I have the king's favor yes he's offered me half the kingdom it seems to be going my way Haman thinks he's in good standing so now I just need one more piece in place and maybe Esther didn't even know all that was going to happen most likely didn't about meeting Mordecai outside and, 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 and Haman getting so angry at Mordecai that he's going to build the gallows and have him executed the next day but all that's going to happen and so Haman could never suppose the outcome of this appointment except to relish in the possibilities. I am in good favor with the king and with the queen. I'm coming to two back-to-back -back banquets with this power couple. And so he's happy. In fact, Haman, in your notes there, Haman had a fourfold reaction to this. Now let's look at this. Start in verse 8. Haman had a fourfold reaction. Talk about being bipolar. This is Haman right here, okay? Haman is bipolar. It says, verse 9, Then went Haman forth that day joyful and with a glad heart. Boy, that sounds great. He is so happy. He's overjoyed. In your notes there, number one, he's overjoyed at the prospect of being invited to a banquet with the king and queen. Again, who in the kingdom was ever permitted to do such a grand thing? To ever have a private dining experience with the king and the queen and on two days in a row? He's in a league by himself, and he knew it. He must have been on cloud nine. He's very happy while he's right there in the king's presence and in the, in the, um, the palace. He's on cloud nine. Had it ever happened to anyone in Persian history before? Maybe not. Probably not. That's probably what he thought. And so, folks, we know what the Scriptures say in the Proverbs. Pride cometh before a fall, or, or pride and, and, uh, and a haughty spirit before destruction. And so he's overjoyed. But look what happens in an instant. In verse 9, let's keep reading. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. Put there in your notes, indignation. He's full of rage. He's full of burning, fuming anger, hot displeasure. That's what that word means there in the Hebrew. The conflict between Haman and Mordecai was more than personal. It was national. We talked about that last week. Haman wanted the total destruction of the Jewish people. And how dare this Jewish disrespectful man having just eaten with the king and the queen, would now not rise or not bow to his presence. And he had no clue that Mordecai was the queen's father figure, cousin, that he was tr treading on dangerous ground. Had no clue. So he goes from jubilance to rage in an instant as soon as he gets outside and happens to see Mordecai there at the gate. And Mordecai, true to form, does not bow, does not do obeisance. So he's overjoyed, then he's offended. Number three, he's obsessed with power and praise. Verse 10, Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself, and when he came home, he sent and called for his friends and Zeresh, his wife. And Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children and all the things wherein the king had promoted him, and now he had advanced him above the princes and servants of the king. Haman said, moreover, verse 12, Yea, Esther the queen did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared but myself, and tomorrow am I invited unto her also with the king. He's now obsessed. I am going to get rewarded. This is going to be wonderful. And so when we get good news, we want to tell others. And so he's telling all of his own, his own uh, servants and his own household what just happened to him. He's sharing the wealth. He wanted to share the good fortune. 
fortune of what has happened to him. And that's a normal reaction, and Haman was no different. He went in immediately home and did exactly that. And um, he transpired the favor that he received and wanted those closest to him to know all about it. And he had every reason to think that he was getting ready for some great honor to be invited to such a banquet. So he's overjoyed, but he's offended. He's obsessed, but number four, he's overcome with bitterness and hatred towards Mordecai. Back in the dumps again, look at verse 13. Yet all this availeth me nothing, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Wow, you talk about swing of emotion. You talk about being jubilant and then depressed and just seething with rage and hatred for someone even though he has all this power you know Hebrews 12 13 describes bitterness as a root that can trouble someone and defile them it means to irritate them to the point of corrupting them and even though it was the happiest day of his life it was the most miserable day of his life because bitterness had begun to taint his character. Bitterness, folks, is an overwhelming, powerful, and destructive attitude. Despite having this unbelievable honor, it was being diluted because of Mordecai. Look what verse 13 says, Yet all this availeth me nothing. I can't be happy as long as my nemesis, my number one enemy, is out there and he does not bow to me. I want every single soul to bow to me. And if I can't have that, I'm not going to be happy. And so he wanted to expedite Mordecai's execution to the next day, not wait till the year end when all the Jews would be killed. I want him dead tomorrow. And so what does he do? He has a 75-foot, a 50-cubit gallows constructed. Verse 14, Then said Zeresh's wife and all his friends unto him, Let a gallows be made of 50 cubits, 75 feet. And tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in merrily. There, <laughs> I'll be happy when he's dead. There's the, that swing of emotion. Then merrily go in with the king under the banquet, and the thing pleased him. And he's happy again. And he caused the gallows to be made because he saw the demise of his enemy as imminent. It's right there. I can do this. You know, bitterness, bitterness can alter our perspective about even the good things of our life if we're not careful. We can let little irritants get under our skin and they begin to grow, and they begin to fester, and it just wells up inside of us with a discontent. Anger and unforgiveness produce bitterness, and that's what, that's what Haman had. He had unforgiveness, and he had anger towards Mordecai. He had envy as well. He had jealousy. I, I don't, why is he being allowed to not bow? And so... Can you think in the scriptures? I'm thinking back to Hannah. Remember Hannah and Elkanah? She was, she was a childless. And she was so bitter because Elkanah had, you know, multiple children and she didn't have any. She was barren. And she couldn't be happy. And so uh, that was Penina. Penina had, had um, numerous children. So Elkanah, her husband, is, is um, going to her saying, Honey, are not I better to thee than what? You remember the story? Than ten sons. You have me as your husband. I adore you. I love you. But she could not be happy because she had this bitter, bitterness about her by not having children. And that's how bitterness does. It's like we can't enjoy the wonderful things of life when bitterness is, is rooted within us. And so it can become an obsession that controls the rest of our lives and jade our perspective of reality. Let me show you here in your notes there the causes of bitterness. Some of the causes of bitterness. Number one, envy at the success of another. Does that resonate with anybody? Don't raise your hand, please. <laughs> Just think about it, right? Being slighted or disrespected. That can cause bitterness. How dare they? How dare they treat me that way? 
How about this one? Being forgotten or overlooked. I don't deserve that. They should be thinking more positively of me than that. I should be getting more positive reinforcement, more accolades, more attention. But being forgotten and overlooked, being treated unfairly or taken advantage of, and then we feel victimized, and that can become that root inside of us that looks through with jaded eyes everything they see they can't find joy in it because they're looking through the eyes of bitterness and because of that one thing it keeps them from enjoying all the other blessings of God in life how about this one not getting your way or having your expectations met disappointed again why won't those people do better and so failed expectations time and time again can cause us to become bitter. The bottom line, folks, is this, that bitterness is caused by pride. It's caused by pride. We elevate ourselves so much because we're not getting what we want, and that is pride. And so we know the king, as a king, is prideful, but here's Haman. He's especially prideful as well. So the king, let's look at that. Number three, the king's reflection. What happens here in chapter six? We'll go quickly through this. One night he couldn't sleep. It says that in verse one. On the night that the king... Uh, could not sleep and he commanded to bring the book of records of the chronicles that they were read before the king wow how exciting is that king I mean he's going to read the book of the display of, of uh, all the history of what's happened in the kingdom he couldn't sleep but God kept him awake it was God working behind the scenes here is God uh, the display of God's sovereignty and control over mankind even over powerful kings he was like that with Nebuchadnezzar the Babylonian king, Cyrus, Darius, now Xerxes. God had control over all those to do his will. They were foreign kings. The king had insomnia on the night before Mordecai would be hung on the gallows, which the king knew nothing about, so God wanted to reveal some important information to the king, so he kept them awake that night. Second, he read from the royal record. How boring, the royal record. Why not read from the adventures of the Arabian Nights or something, you know? The Three Musketeers or something exciting. He read the dry, boring legal records of what happened in his kingdom. Well, what records would be read? If you know the story, God had supernaturally ordained all the records to be pulled out and read that very night. It was the royal records because God had to devise a way to protect his people and destroy the enemies. Let us see, the record of Mordecai's loyalty was read to the king. Folks, now listen. Of all things the king read about Mordecai's protection of the king that foiled the plot of the two assassins against the king's life, that's what was read. Of everything that could have been brought to the king, it was that little incident, that little issue, not little in terms of the importance, but amongst so many other rules and laws that were written and the record, it was that. Now, get this. That event that Mordecai did in revealing the assassins, that was four years ago. That was four years earlier. And of all things to pull out the book of that record on that night, it was that very thing that God brought to the king's attention. There were thousands of records recorded annually, so over four years, there's dozens of thousands that God had supernaturally orchestrated the king's insomnia and the reading of that royal record about Mordecai from four years earlier on the very night treachery was planned against this Jewish man, and he needed to be protected by the king. The deed had gone unrewarded, and so what a time to reward this loyal subject, and so that's exactly what happened. And so, verse three, verse 3 of chapter 6, And the king said, What honor and dignity have been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, There is nothing done for him. How about that? Timing's everything. Letter E, Haman had arrived at the precise moment the king was looking to honor Mordecai. Get this, verse 4, And the king said, Who's in the court? Now Haman was come into the court, outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king, walking to the king's palace to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. He's walking in right now to say, King, I want to destroy Mordecai 
because of who he is and he won't bow and all of his people I want him out right now and as he's walking in to tell the king that the king had just read that Mordecai needed to be honored because he protected the king's life at that very moment letter F Haman unknowingly would be the one to determine the honor given to such to his arch enemy boy God it's almost like he has a sense of humor the very thing that's, that Haman is thinking I'm going to be rewarded he's, he's going to ask me about how someone that he cares about should be rewarded out of his own mouth is going to be uttered what he's going to give to his arch enemy right you know the story verse 6 so Haman came in and the king said unto him what shall be done unto the man whom the king delighted to honor now Haman thought in his heart to whom would the king delight to do honor more than myself? That's got to be me. Well, king, let me tell you, I have a couple of good ideas. And Haman answered the king, for the man whom the king delighted to honor, let the royal apparel be brought which the king uses to wear, and the horse that the king rideth upon, and the crown royal which is set upon his head, and let this apparel and the horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that they may array the man with all whom the king delighted to honor and bring him on horseback through the street of the city and proclaim before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighted to honor. King, I'm ready to be bestowed. Just go ahead and lay it on me. You know, just like that. That's what's happening here. God's got this. God's got this. In your notes, letter G, the king reveals the subject to receive the honor, verse 10. As soon as he gets done saying this, the king said to Haman, Make haste and take up the apparel and the horse as thou hast said, and do even so to a Mordecai, the Jew, that sitteth at the king's gate. Let nothing fail of all that thou hast spoken. How in the world could Mordecai get this level of treatment? How could it not be him? And so, letter G, the king reveals the subject to receive the honor and it was none other than Mordecai and so Mordecai gets strutted if you will around the palace around the Shushan around the kingdom to, uh, to show that it was him who saved the king we see here finally in closing Haman's rejection verse 12 and Mordecai came again to the king's gate but Haman hasted to his house mourning and having his head covered. And Haman told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had befallen him. Then said the wise men and Zeresh, his wife, unto him, If Mordecai be, on the seat of, be of the seat of the Jews before whom thou hast begun to fall, thou shalt not prevail against him, but thou shalt surely fall before him. Even his own wife is saying that. You're in trouble, Haman. And while they were yet talking with him came the king's chamberlains and hasted to bring Haman unto the banquet that Esther had prepared. The king still doesn't know anything. In your notes, A, Haman knew that he was in trouble. His wife knew that he was in trouble. His servants knew that he was in trouble. He put the cover over his head. That was a sign of grief. Second, Haman shared his misfortunes with his wife and trusted advisors. And so, given the turn of events with his enemy, Mordecai is close